fans on her page, fans on Comic Spot, and Linda Marcus Smith. You guys, today, I am so proud and so humbled to have Carol Montgomery here. Let me tell you real briefly about this lady. Yes, she has served our troops comedy. She has served up comedy to the troops. She's done comedy from Haiti to Honduras, you guys. Let's talk real talk i don't think she was in the military but we're gonna find out she was a sing and still is a single mom she claims to have raised a child to maturity and that's a feat we know it's no easy being a it's not easy being a single mom actually she, I, I no no i'm not a single mom i am married i am married oh it said single mom on the on the internet well somebody made it wrong <laughs> somebody yeah i'm not I've been married for a very long time. He's just, he's, he's the man behind the woman. Okay, we got to correct that one. She's not a single mom, guys. Back off. <laughs> so Carol Montgomery is also the creator and host of what is a famous huge hit on Showtime since March 2019, Women of a Certain Age. Funny Women of a Certain Age and a follow-up, More Funny Women of a Certain Age. I couldn't be prouder to have her here. So let's go to Carol Montgomery. Hi, Carol. Hello, how are you? Wonderful, thank you. It's so lovely to get to have you. I saw your show, Women, Funny Women of a Certain Age in New York a couple years ago when it first came out. When the show was, well, actually before the show went to Showtime, I saw right. it in a theater. Yes, at the Crane. Super funny. Thank you. Thank it's so much. worth seeing if you're a man or a woman or anything in between, anything on any spectrum. This show <laughs> is hilarious, hilarious. Thank you have you. a great lineup all the time. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I created the show, first of all, to give women over 50 a voice because when you're in show business, um, once you turn fit, really when, once you turn 40, you start to lose your voice. And then of course, 50, you might as well just be wearing an invisibility cloak. So I created the show. It, it, we, we, it's always a rotating cast. Uh, I have regulars on the show, but it's always a rotating cast. I want, I, I'm trying to give as much work to as many female comics who are older as I can. That's amazing. That's so great. Do you understand how proud I am to have you here today? Uh, that's I, even if you weren't here, I'm so proud to just know you're out there doing this for women of a certain age. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, everything came screeching to a halt, of course, with the pandemic, but um, the first special uh, was uh, Showtime's highest rated comedy special of 2019. And yes. so it, it went so well that they decided to give us another one. And the ratings, because it ended up premiering um, of the weekend of the quarantine, I hear the ratings that were pretty amazing for the second one also. So we'll I'm see, hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll get a third one. And originally you had Fran Drescher as a part of it. What a great way to kick off a show. Yeah, Fran is, uh, is, is, is one of the greatest, you, you know, for who she is, she is probably one of the most wonderful, humble, kind, generous human beings I've ever met. And um, the rest of the show was Fran Drescher, it was Lynn Coplitz, it was Lunell, Vanessa Hollingshead, Carrie Louise, and myself. The second show uh, was Caroline Ray was the star of it. And then we had um, Tammy Pescatelli, Carol Liefer, um, Thea Vidal, Julia Scotti, and myself. I'm forgetting somebody. No, 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 I got everyone. Tammy, Thea, Julia, Carol, Caroline. Yeah, so and Caroline also. Caroline and Carol Liefer, both well-known 
veterans of the scene and could not have been kinder. And, and it, it's always it's always nice when you meet people that you that have had major success and they turn out to be just wonderful human beings, yes. you know? Yes. Well, let's talk about your rise from Brooklyn, New York to where you are today. You're all over Forbes and you've been in the New York Post and you've been on Hoda Kabi and Jenna Bush show. Yeah, we were, early. well, we actually, we did the Today Show. That was, we did the Today Show. Literally, it was the last uh, piece of press that we did because we taped it on a Thursday. It aired on Friday. We were all talking about how, you know, how important it is because it had not reached, the pandemic had not reached where it became. And we were all talking about the importance of laughter. So we had the Today Show, then the show aired. And then Monday they shut the city yes. down. So I was like, that's it. But I started, um, I started in a, at a club called Pips in Sheepshead Bay, which was also where Richard Jenny started and David Brenner and Joan Rivers. And um, I, I just always wanted to do this. So I, I was very young. I think I was, I want to say I was 21 when I started doing stand-up. And like I always joke on stage, you know, I've been doing stand-up over 40 years. I could have killed somebody and been out of jail already. <laughs> If I had known that that was going to be, you know, I mean, it's been a long, you know, a long career, ups and downs and some great stuff, some horrible stuff, but, you know, I'm still here. And now you get to help create shows where other people do the killing for you. True. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that's the one thing I'm very proud of with my, and, and, and it's really important when, when, when I talk about the show, every woman that I've put on a show is... It, has the chops to do it. And what I mean by that is if, you, you know, there are a lot of women who are in there who are over 50, who have been doing stand-up for, a few, you know, a few years or something. That's not the same thing as being a veteran. That's not someone who's, this is really to sh to showcase the women that have been doing, you know, been through every crappy condo and crappy nightclub. And, you know, it's so funny when we talk about, you know, all the comedy clubs are talking about how they're going to try to figure out how to, get audiences back and as far as cleaning and you know most comedy clubs are filthy they're just filthy you know and so i i, I was when the, when the pandemic first happened I, I i literally went on stage with wipes and said i'm so happy for the pandemic because i can finally clean this damn microphone because it's been so filthy so um you know so it's it's more about the women that have have been there you know who've been slugging it out for 20 30 years and don't have don't have any recognition. Absolutely. I know that, you know, I being only in comedy six years, I've asked for spots on different shows. Right. And since I've been doing, this is my 222nd interview on wow. Comic Spot. Since being humbled by the amount of years of hard work and labor everybody's put into comedy, I'm rethinking, you know, Lord Almighty, there's so much talent out there that isn't getting booked. Oh, well, yeah. I, you know, you, the amount of time, you know, I always say this because I teach stand up also. You, you, I didn't really even get my chops together probably until I was in it for 10 years. And most, most veteran comics will tell you that. You have to, you know, before you're even, you even know who you are, you're doing this 10 years. This is not a, oh, I'll go to college for four years and I'll have a job. This is every night going out, working on the set, going on stage, feeling comfortable enough. Um, so that's why, you know, there, and there's there's so many women. There's so many, what I originally wanted it just to be 50 and over. So I had, I would say probably 100, maybe 200 women. And then I, I said, well, you know what? There's a lot of women in their 40s that have been around. And when I opened it up to 40, I probably doubled it. There's probably at least 500 women. And I've only been able to, I've probably been able to use about 60 of them. So there's so many women I still want to use, but we have to see when live entertainment comes back. So that's, that's a whole other interview. <laughs> Absolutely. What's something that's been, you know, like what have you learned that you never thought you would learn from doing funny women of a certain age and more funny of women of a certain age? Um, I learned that if you have a really good idea and you work hard at it, you know, a lot of people, you know, there's, you know, as you know, in our business, there's a lot of people that like to just go, oh, why did they get that? Oh, I hate that. You know, you have to work hard. You have to, 
you know, people will tell you if you who know me, I wake up when when I had when I got the idea for this, I was up every morning. I was on my computer by nine o'clock and I didn't get off the computer probably till two in the afternoon, just working on ideas and getting, you know, just the, the little things making the I, I do the website for the show. Um, I, I was, you know, I, I do I do basically everything. So um, the most important thing is to, if you have an idea, don't just think, oh, I have a great idea. You have to execute the idea the same way. And, and that's what I did. I was very lucky. My, my producing partner, which is Killer, Killer Bunny Entertainment, which is Dave Goldberg and Rob Sia, Dave and I, we, Dave's like my kid brother. And um, we, we met producing another t uh, TV special from a comedian named Chang. And we just, we just became very close. And he's, he, between the two of us, we were able to sell this. But, you know, and, but, and he, I, I mean, it's funny because I know how much I work. He works twice as hard as I do. So a lot of it, you know, you know people, people are always looking for that easy way. And it's, it's the, you have to work hard every single day. And people think now that I have the show and I have the two specials that yeah, I must be living... I'm like, no, I want to do a third show. I want to do a series. I want to do a documentary based on this. I want, I don't want to, I'm not going to stop just because I got something, which is great, but I'm going to continue to do this as, and, and still have to work hard. Yes. It's such a great title too. Funny women of a certain age, you know, like who in their, in their family wouldn't want to go see it. It's just right. the best name. Did well, you come also, up Yes, I did come up with the name. I did come up with the name. Um, well, we originally was called Women of a Certain Age Comedy. And um, when we went to Showtime, they were like, and this is fascinating to me because I don't really understand. You know, you, you forget, you think, oh God, all I want to do is be on TV. But you forget there's a lot of things on the network side that has to be done. And the reason we changed it to Funny Women is because with streaming, the letter F comes up before the letter W. So when you're looking for something on, on Hulu or Netflix, right? You, when, you, when, you, when you put double, you know, you, it, it's, they had this whole lo logarithm, algorithm thing. And I was like, all right, that works. Let's do funny women. Like it was, it was amazing. You, 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 people don't realize what goes on behind the scenes of a network. And the network, my, my network exec was the one that said, well, why don't we just put funny in front of it? And I went, okay, perfect. Wow. Well, it's a big hit. How many cities have you been to already? Mm. Well, you know what? Probably a dozen, give or take. I'd really have to, you know, because yeah. my mind is always full of stuff. Um, we did have a tour. We, we did some with a big agency, and we were supposed to have a tour in October all through the West Coast. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, most of the West Coast doesn't think they're coming back till 2021 so we have three different tours in the spring two weeks in the on the west coast two weeks in florida and two weeks on the east coast and then we're trying to get some stuff in the midwest so that will be great because that's a bunch of different cities that we haven't been to that's awesome i'd like to talk a little bit about since i can't talk about having been a single mother yeah. <laughs> because you're not that would be so wrong Let's talk about your Armed Forces Entertainment comedy. Because um, I'm a veteran. I, I know you are. And I just thank you so much for making veteran military laugh. I'm well, sure, I'm sure thank you, you made veterans laugh too. Thank you. And thank you for being a veteran. Um, I um, have, oh, this is really interesting and I'm, I won't get very political, but a lot of people think because I'm a New Yorker, I have certain views and um, I am very pro-military. I will, I will always be pro-military. My father fought in the Korean War, um, so I will always defend our, our armed forces to the, to the death. Um, I was asked for years to go overseas. And I just the first time I went overseas, uh, my son was 18 years old. And I thought, okay, I've raised him. He's grown up now. I don't have to worry about him. And so yeah. the first tour we ever did was we went overseas to Iraq. And um, it was, I think, I, I don't really remember. I think it was 10 days. Um, we flew into Kuwait, um, uh, uh, did some shows there at, um, I forgot the base. 
but it's the base that when the, when the war was over, you everyone saw the base. It was like that. I was like, I was there. Um, and then we, <laughs> then we, then we um, flew to. You know, we would fly from Kuwait um, to all the different bases in Iraq um, by a Black Hawk helicopter. And uh, you know, any time you know, my favorite time was, of course, I love doing stand up for them. My favorite time is after the show. Because especially in, in the Middle East where it's a dry country, so you can't, you know, we're, we're sitting around drinking, you know, sodas. But I really wanted to engage with the soldiers because a lot of the soldiers were my son's age. And um, so I wanted to engage with them and, you know, let them know that we, we love them and, 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 and uh, you know, we're there for them. So, so for me, it's always been about honoring my father and, um, and honoring the people that serve. And one of the things that's really important that people have to understand about the, the military is um, there. I I never. That was really funny because the, the we we had people from both sides of the political spectrum on the tour with us, and yet we all we all knew none of us did anything that was. They loved all of us because we all had a different point of view. So um, so. You have to support them. You, ha you, you know, they're they're doing the most dangerous job in the world. They're protecting us from the people, at, the rest of the country, worlds that wants to do harm to us. Yes, absolutely. So when you engaged with the troops who were your son's age, yes, what's the coolest interaction you had with a soldier that you will never forget? Oh, I, um, it was in Iraq. Um, I did my show. And right after the show, a soldier came up to me and said that his wife had given birth while I was on stage. <gasps> oh my gosh. And I said to him, did you name him after me? He goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, but the least you could do is name the baby after me because it was a boy. I went, all right, no problem. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, you know, and, and, and in the entire time I was there, there was only one young man that I felt was very dark and was very upset with being in the military. Not being, not, you know, he joined, but saw things that were, you know, and I spent a lot of time with him just talking, just to have him clear his mind. And, you know, because you do see you, war is not what, um, war isn't the Avengers, yes. you know, people yes. think, oh, all this blowing up. It's like, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. Have you entertained military and veterans around the country too? Inside? I have not. I have not. Um, we've done a couple of small shows. We were we were going to go down to um, Walter Reed. We were trying to come go down and and and, and do some shows for the, the the troops that were injured. But you know, it's a lot of political red tape, and it's much harder. And this is it's it's much harder to to get um, benefits for veterans once they be, they stop being um, uh, mil once they stop serving. Um, I, you know, if, if you want to go overseas and, and, and support and go out and perform for those troops, go ahead. But as soon as they stop doing what they're doing, it's like, nobody cares about them anymore. And it's Amen. like, you know what, <laughs> that's when you need to do it is I, I have been wanting to do shows for military families, for the wives, the women that are, you know, their, their, their husbands, uh, you know, or their mothers, the mothers are, of these sons. They don't have any. They don't have any release. You know, it's always about the troops, the troops, the troops, which is great. But when you become a soldier or you're part of the military, that includes your whole entire family. My father never talked about what happened. You know, he never talked about um, uh, the war ever to me. Um, he ha he got a Purple Heart. He was injured. He never talked about it. Um, so, so it's really important to have this discussion about, okay, yes, they did a great job overseas. What are we doing for the military? What are we doing for the vets once they get home? And I think entertainment should be one of the things. Me I think comedy is really important. Do you know how many times I've been kicked out of VA hospitals and buildings for oh, trying yeah. to make people laugh? Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> and it's like, why would why would you not want to do that? I mean, I, I don't understand. It's like, it's okay that they risk their lives for you, but oh, okay, well, that's all we need. We we don't need you to, you know. These people come home there. I can tell you, the the longest I went away for, 
I want to say we were gone for three weeks and I don't remember where because I have no memory left. But for me, and I was gone for three weeks to be in uh, on military bases and do what and live that life. It took me a week to get back to normal. Absolutely. When we came back from Iraq, especially, I came home. I my my husband said, now I get up because I'm an old woman, but I get up every every in the middle of the night three or four times. I have to go pee. I came home from the trip from Iraq. I went to bed. I did not wake up for I think 36 hours. My husband would 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 literally go over, make sure I was breathing, and then so so to so, so just understand like that's what people have to understand is. And I did that. I was gone for two to three weeks. If you're in battle, like Leanne Lord, who is one of my dearest friends, and she's she's also my one of my tour buddies, and she's a brilliant comedian. I remember one time she she was a runner, and she was talking to some of the troops. And I think this was when we were in Djibouti, and she said, "I'd like to run with you guys if it's okay." One morning, they said, "Okay, you know, we we run at five. And she goes, "I'll be there." So she goes to run with them and she's dressed as a runner and they're all dressed of course in full uniform with their backpacks and their AK-47. <laughs> and she said she's running going, this is the most surreal thing in the world. Cause she's, you know, that, and that's, that they don't even, like I can't even, I can't, I could never be in the military because I, I'd have to pee every 10 minutes and I couldn't do <laughs> that. So that um, people have to realize that, that, you know, once the veterans come home, it's 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 just as important if not more to- I told uh, I told some jokes in the middle of the night at a VA hospital in the cafeteria to a man who wheeled himself in, in a wheelchair, and he had an exposed knee. There was a hole in his knee. And he was like my age. And I was like, he didn't just get back from battle. Right. So I said, what in the world are they doing to you here? And he said, they, they gave me a knee replacement, but they didn't have the knee to put in it. So he has to stay in the hospital, oh, keeping no. it lubed up. So I oh, said, do you no. want to hear some jokes? And I told him, you know, some of my five year into the business jokes. And he politely laughed. And, and he said, do you know what it does to us when you comedians tell us jokes? And I said, no, tell me. And he said, it, all the pain of the war and things we had to do for our country that other people didn't appreciate, you take that pain away from us. Of course, of course. You know, I mean, that, that I, I, and one of the, not, you know, when my dad, my, my dad, you know, he, he, he had dementia and he passed away, but he, he was, he, he saw that I, you know, he knew that I went and I did, I've done 11 tours overseas. And, Thank you um, so much. and, and he, he said to me after I got back from Iraq, he said, you know, I remember being in the army and seeing Bob Hope. So I, you know, it was a big deal for me to be able to, in fact, when I went to Korea, um, uh, we were, you know, we went to, we were, we were in the DMZ and, you know, and, and we went, you know, we were going to different places and I was trying to figure out where exactly my father had been shot. Cause I think we were close to it, but, <laughs> and they said, don't engage the North Koreans. And I was like, no, I would never engage them. And of course, when my, Escort wasn't looking. I was flipping off all of the North Koreas. And he's like, you can't do that. I said, uh, do what? I didn't do anything. I was just, my hands were out like this, you know? And it was just, it was great. They were laughing at me like, you can't do that, Carol. I said, well, <laughs> I already did, didn't I? So, so yeah. So, so, and like I said, he never really talked about it. And I wish, I wish we could have really spoken about it, but he was very proud that I did go. So I, so, so that I know that he was, he was happy. So that's all that matters to me, as long as my dad was happy. Well, you know, I know it's a little late to say thank you to your father for his service, but still, thank you to your father for his service. Yeah, he, he you know, my father was an interesting man, you know? I mean, he would be, with everything that's happening in this, in the world right now, he would be heartbroken because he always fought against that. My favorite story about my dad was that he was at, he was in basic training I want to say Texas. I, you know, like I said, I'm not really good on it. Um, and uh, there was a dance, and the black soldiers and the white soldiers were separated by a rope. And my father walked over and he pulled the rope down. And that really, you know, when he said everybody danced together, my father was a private. He wasn't. He wasn't a 
uh, you know, he just was like, really, this is what you're going to do? And he pulled the rope away and, and everyone danced together, which, you know, back then we've got to be talking about the Korean War was in the early 50s. So we're talking major. So, you know, my dad was a cool guy. He was, you know, I, and I'm, I'm glad I, I'm glad that he's not around to see all this because he'd be so sad. He'd be so upset. Yes. Yes. This is hor so heartbreaking what's going on right now. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, like we didn't have enough to deal with with the pandemic, especially on the East Coast. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's well, New York is starting to wake up. Um, we uh, we're supposed to open June 1st, uh, June 8th. But um, we'll see what happens because, you know, we don't know how many more, you, you know, uh, you go in, um, it's every two weeks. So we'll probably open for phase one. And then you have to have, you have to meet these benchmarks for two weeks and then you move to the next phase. And with everything that's happening, we're not opening. <laughs> we're, not, we're not getting to phase two probably still sometime in the August. Because there's, there has to be, a, with everything that's happening, there's going to be a spike in, in, in cases again. And we are, yep. we're, we're at the epicenter. But that's going to be a spike in everywhere because there's protests all over the world. Absolutely. I'm staying in until after the flu season. I, I'm <laughs> too vulnerable, you know? I'm a woman right. of a certain age. I'm yeah. trying to become funny. Right. <laughs> I don't want right. to lose my funny. Yeah, no, it's very, it's, it's, it's a different world now. You know, um, I have been invited to millions of Zoom shows. I, I, I won't do them. I will do interview shows like yours. Thank I you have so my, much. I have, a, I have my show, The Early Bird Special, which will be airing this afternoon at four Eastern time, which is an interview show. Um, I will interview and I will talk, but I, I, I and look, I, I, there are some people that are doing great shows on Zoom that you can actually see, you know, you can hear the audience. I just, I mean, the funny thing about all this is for years, I used to say I'm the laziest comic in the world. I would, I would love to do stand up from my bed. And now everybody is doing stand up from their bed. <laughs> Where is your show at four o'clock Eastern today? Where can people see? It'll be on Facebook live on my, on my page. Um, um, uh, uh, and Julia Scotty's fan page. Cause Julia Scotty is my co-host and I love uh, her. Oh, she's the best. She's uh, she, and we work really well together. It's it's a it's a really it's a really wonderful. Uh, rela she's 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 way more. Like, like she'll always call me and go. Okay, so I think we should talk about this today. I'm like, sure. <laughs> How often is your show on? It's on every every Wednesday at four p.m. And the reason I did this was, um, you know, so many people were like, "Oh, you should do this. You should." And I really, honestly, when the pandemic hit, I just didn't have the heart. My, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I still every day go, what just happened? And then, of course, on top of everything else that's happening. Um, so um, it's, you know, I, I, I'm doing the show pretty much to open up the, basically, it's, it's extension of Funny, the Funny Women series, except that we're just talking about what it's like to be a woman in the business and talk about our uh, our experiences. So it's just an extension. It's only only it's it's not stand up. I can't wait to hear it. I got to do a guest spot at the L.A. Comedy Club here in Vegas at the Strat. Are you in and Vegas now? Yeah, I moved I to thought, Vegas. I thought you would. I thought you were in. Were you in Portland? I was okay. in Portland okay. at Harvey's, and then I was like, I came here on a visit, and it, Stephen Pearl took me over to the, uh, meet Harry Basil and all the people, and I was like, why am I in Portland, Oregon? So I moved here, and I, did a, get, I did a guest spot there, and the club owner came up to me, speaking of women over a certain age, he came up to me and he said, I didn't even know you were a comedian. I've been there like 30 times sitting with all the comics. It right. never dawned on him. I could right. be a comic. Right. I guess I'm of a certain age. So. Right, right, right. Well, well, that's, that goes without saying, you know, that's, that's, that's par for the course in this business, but good for you. You know, there's some really nice rooms that, in, I mean, I, you know, I lived in Vegas for 10 years. I did not know that. 
so you you know the scene out here very yeah, well. Then. Yeah, I was um I was in I was uh in a production show called Crazy Girls, which is was at the old Riviera, which is now no longer there, and then a show called Midnight Fantasy, which is at the Luxor still. So um, yeah, so I mean I love Vegas. I would go back to Vegas. In fact, we're we're trying to see about getting a residency in Vegas, but like I said, everything came to a a crashing standstill until we figure out how to get uh, people to be safe in live entertainment. How do you feel that the pandemic made you a better human being? Because you were a wonderful human being <laughs> before. You had a great dad. And so you, had, you were brought up right to be a great human. But how do you become greater than that? Um, I just, I, well, thank you very um, for the compliments. Um, I, uh, I, 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 I've, I've always been brought up to treat people with kindness. I always taught that to my son. I mean, um, you know, when you, when you become a parent, you all bets are off because now you're raising somebody to be, you know, so you have to be like, I remember having a, my son, I, my son is my Yoda because I've, I've learned so much from my child, but he, he brings, he, I wanted to make sure he was a certain type of human being and he is. Um, so, so from the pandemic, you know, I, I've always been, look, I have a big mouth. I always talk to everybody that, you know, but now when I go into the grocery store and I, you know, the grocery store, I know all the girls, I've known them forever. So, um, you know, I call, you know, how are you? You know, how, how's your family? How you, one of the girls at the grocery store, um, she has a daughter. I mean, this is really kind of cool, but her, her boss would let her bring the daughter in because she worked late. You know, I, I, I always kept engaging. Now I'm even more engaging because everyone is in the same boat. Everyone is, I, that's the thing that, and, and getting back to what's happening now with the protests, you know, what the media doesn't want you to see because the media wants you, to, will always want you to see bad, whether it's mainstream media, right media, left media, whatever, they always want you to see bad. But I can tell you as a New Yorker, that the people, everyone is being kind to each other. I'm not talking about on the, like when I'm walking on the street, there's, you know, if, and New York has very small streets, so everyone's wearing masks. And so people now will move aside to let you go through the, you know, and, I, and when, I, when they do that, I go, thank you very much. And they you know, I make sure to engage people. You know, I love dogs and I, you know, I, I can't have a dog in the apartment. So when I see people, I'm like, that's a beautiful dog. You know, can I, or or if I see somebody dressed nice, that I I I, I I'm ta I'm not going to not be nice to people, and instead of keeping it quiet, I make sure I engage with people. And you know what? Like literally yesterday, it was so funny. We were walk. My husband and I walked twice a twice a day because the gyms are all closed, and we were walking. And I saw this good-looking young man. He was walking down the street. He had he had on a tank top, and he was carrying two 15-pound weights. Now, my husband and I, when we heard about the pandemic was going to have, you know, we, we tried to get home weights so we could lift because we both like to lift weights. So as he's walking up, I go, how the hell did you get those weights? They're <laughs> there for, and he looked at me, started laughing, goes, they're mine. I was like, all right. And we both had, we had a great, you know, so that's engage, you know, nobody is scary if you engage with them. So I think the pandemic should teach everybody to, to just be a little bit kinder because no one knows what another person is going through. We all are judged on how we look and nobody knows what we're feeling inside. And I think it's important that you take that moment and go, how are you? Hey, that's a great, hey, be safe. I always tell everyone to stay safe, that's you nice. know? Very lovely. Thank so you. is there anything you want to tell people where to follow you? I'll be um, putting your links up that you sent you. me. I mean, you know, I, I if you Google me, you'll I pretty much come up anywhere. You know, I mean, I you know, I've been around a long time, so, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, you'll have all the links on there. You know, you can go to my website, carolmontgomery.com. You can go to the uh, Funny Women website, which is women of a certain age comedy.com. Like I said, if you Google me, I come up. You can always find me, you know, but, you know, follow me, uh, you know, watch the show. It's still streaming. My son was so adorable. Well, Showtime was was um, was free, I think, on Amazon for about two months during the pandemic. 
Then he sent me a screenshot. It was both of the shows back to back. He goes, mom, look. So, you know, watch the show. If you like the show, email Showtime. Like one of the things that people still forget is that you can still do that. You can still say, um, write an email and go, hey, you know, I saw the show. I thought it was great. It, it, it only helps our cause if more people say, we want to see more of this. So many women can't have, have written to me that aren't comments. They're just women of a certain age. They're like, finally, something, something that we can enjoy. You know, it's like, God, you know, like I, I've had so many male comics go, why don't you do men of a certain age? I'm like, because that's the entire comedy business. So why would we do that? Do you really think Jim Gaffigan or Ray Romano needs to have a show called Men of, you know, well, actually, Ray Romano did have a show called Men of a Certain Age, but that was a, <laughs> that was a drama series. But the point is, they don't need to have the spotlight put on them. They're already successful. I'm trying to help women become more successful. Absolutely. You know, there's cities like Portland, Oregon, where women of a certain age in the city don't go to comedy because the comedy doesn't speak to them at all. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, that's the, that's the problem is, you know, you have, you know, the, the great thing that about my network, Showtime, is that they got it from the moment we pitched it to them. They understood that there was going to be a, a market for this and they and they were brilliant about it. So um, and they, you know, and when the show ended up being the highest rated special 2019, they knew they had something. There's a huge market for women over 50 and men over 50 because, uh, you know, when we both shows when we taped, it was 50, 50 men, you know, 50 men, women. It was also half older people and half younger people. I this saw isn't, that. You, this isn't just for all, you know, for our age, everybody, you know, everybody loves the show. Absolutely. Yes. I saw that when I went to see you in New York, I saw that the audience was not just older people and it was not just women and right. everybody had a roaring great time. So yeah. get on yeah. Showtime and watch Funny Women of a Certain Age and more Funny Women of a Certain Age and let Showtime know. You can send them a message and tell them, listen, I really enjoyed it. We want more. Yes, we want more. We want more. More, more, more. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I know that you're going to have more and more successes because you, you think right. Thank you, you very much. Thank yes. you so much. I and, just enjoyed uh, and this so much. I enjoyed it too. And enjoy Vegas. It's a wonderful town. You know, I I'm love it. The people here are so amazingly welcoming me with open arms. I just love it here. Yeah. So, and, um, and, and give it, if you, when you see Stephen Pearl, give him a hug for me. I'll do that. Okay. I'll go do that. Okay. Thank you so much, Carol Montgomery. Take care. Have a great, Thank everyone stay safe. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Everybody's